Well, welcome back to In the Word for Wednesday. Uh, today we'll be looking at Matthew 27, verses 32 through 66. This is Jesus' death and burial. You know, my goal at Theo Faith is to keep you in the Word, to keep you reading the Bible um, and encouraging you in that, pointing things out to enrich your reading and your study of the Word. So I'm so happy you are sticking with us and uh, are spending time in the Word. It's transformative. I want to point out a few things uh, in today's reading. Uh, number one, uh, take note of all the people who are witnessing Jesus' crucifixion. Uh, I made a list here of the people who are mentioned. Uh, verse 32 talks about Simon of Cyrene, someone who is impressed into labor uh, to carry Jesus' cross since Jesus was so weakened uh, by the beatings and scourgings that he's received and he's been uh, up since um, early uh, the previous day, so he is exhausted. So Simon and Cyrene is pulled into uh, and forced to carry Jesus' cross. In verse 36, uh, there is a crucifixion detail. It just refers to as they. And uh, this is a group of soldiers whose job it was to um, crucify condemned criminals. And they are um, at work in verse 36. Um, in verse 38, you see two robbers uh, that are there. So we have Simon and Cyrene, a group uh, in the crucifixion detail. I would guess there were probably four or five soldiers. Then we have two robbers on either side of Jesus. And then in verse 39, we have... Um, Passerbys, uh, people who are walking on the road, uh, they're outside of Jerusalem, outside the city. Remember, this is happening on um, Passover weekend. And we know from sources outside the Bible that there may have been as many as 2 million people in the city crowding in at this point, coming from all over the Roman Empire. So uh, countless people would have been walking by on the road, witnessing what's happening, seeing the crucifixion. And the uh, uh, Romans would have done this in a uh, very public place. Uh, crucifixion was a warning to others that would rebel against warn Rome that this is the fate that awaits them. So they would go out of their way to make the crucifixion in a very public place. Going on then, uh, drop down a ver couple verses, and in verse 41 we see the chief priests the scribes and the elders are um, witnesses there. This could be as many as the whole Sanhedrin at this point. Seventy people come out to witness uh, what they've um, persuaded Pilate to do. Uh, we have bystanders in verse uh, 47. Uh, people who have gathered to watch the spectacle uh, of what Jesus is uh, going through and what these uh, two robbers on the cross are experiencing. Might have been followers of them, might have been people who were disgusted with what they were doing, uh, a mix, uh, but very many uh, bystanders standing by. Um, we go down to verse 53 for a moment, and we see the centurion, and it just says simply those with him. So a centurion would be a, a leader or a captain of a guard of a hundred soldiers. That's where you get the word centurion, century, a hundred soldiers would be under his command if they were at their full uh, allotment of soldiers. So they could have up to a hundred soldiers nearby. Why would the soldiers be there? Because uh, this is a uh, potentially uh, um, a situation that's going to cause a riot. We've seen how, how the crowd was worked up uh, and Jesus' trial and how the uh, chief priest and the elders whipped them up to a frenzy, screaming out, crucify him, release for us Barabbas. So here we have um, the centurion and his soldiers called to stand by in case there's a need to put down a rebellion. Remember, Jesus had at one point actually thousands of people who were uh, following him. Sorry about that. And... Um, so we have um, the centurion and those with him. And then in verse 55, uh, many women, three are named here, 
uh, but many women indicates to me anyway suggest that there was a large group. Uh, we know from Luke's gospel that uh, women supported Jesus's ministry financially and um, they were following him and so we find the women there um, following Jesus as well. So quite a few people uh, witnessing, standing by, watching, silent, uh, perhaps cheering as uh, this crucifixion is being carried out. I'm going to come back to that in a moment, but um, look at verse 50 where it says, Jesus cried out with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. It's very important here. Uh, Jesus was not um, killed. Uh, he yielded up his spirit that he voluntarily gave up his life on the cross there. And in giving up his life, um, he has opened a doorway uh, to all humanity for the inestimable riches of salvation that's available to all those who believe. So Jesus did this voluntarily. Jesus went to the cross. Um, he could have, as it says in another gospel, called down 10 legions of angels, 10,000 angels to protect him, but he did not. He could have uh, avoided the cross, but he did not. Uh, instead, he went to the cross, he suffered, and then yielded up his spirit. And again, opens the door. You know, in Colossians 3.11, I've got Colossians on my mind because I'm teaching that in a Bible study. It says that Greek, Jew, uncircumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave or free, are all, salvation is available to them all through the death of Jesus that we're witnessing here in verse 50. That Jesus made this possible for all kinds of people. He made it um, available without distinction, without distinction for um, their uh, background, their na national origin, their class. Um, in our time, uh, we don't look at people as uh, circumcised and uncircumcised, Greek or Jew. We look a lot at race. We look a lot at economic status. Jesus's death is universally sufficient. Doesn't mean everyone's going to be saved, but his uh, salvation is available without distinction uh, to all kinds of people. And Jesus opens up this treasure store uh, of divine mercy uh, just simply by believing. One theologian lists over 33 uh, riches that are ours because of Jesus' death. Uh, I lift, listed just a few here. We're redeemed by his death. That is, he pays the penalty that frees us from slavery to sin. We are reconciled to God through his death. Uh, when we believe, so that this enmity, this uh, hatred, this uh, 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 that we are God's enemy has come to an end. The enmity is um, completed, and when we come to faith in Jesus, when we simply believe, uh, we are reconciled to God. God is propitiated, so we are reconciled, we are redeemed, but God, on the Godward side, he is propitiated, that is, he's made essentially friendly toward us. Uh, when we have uh, faith in Jesus, Jesus's merits become ours. His righteousness becomes our righteousness and God is now favorably disposed to us. He's got our back. In other words, he is looking out for our best interests, propitiation, and we're adopted into the family of God uh, in a special way. Uh, we often hear that people say that we're all God's children. Well, I understand the sentiment, but it's the uh, those who have faith, placed their faith in Jesus, are truly God's children, are accepted into their, into His family. And let me just emphasize that this, these riches, these four I listed here, and many, many more, uh, become ours, uh, are appropriated by faith. So, if uh, for a person who is not a believer. Um, if you have not committed yourself to Jesus Christ, all these benefits 
uh, through Jesus' death become yours simply by faith. We see faith mentioned uh, over 150 times uh, by my count in the Gospels. In the Gospel of John alone, we have uh, believe mentioned 98 times, the necessity of believing in Jesus. Remember, John's Gospel was written in order to give people a reason to believe in Jesus, to give evidence for who he was, to demonstrate who he was, so that they would believe. Uh, the word repent is never used in John's Gospel. So it's just simply believe. Believe in the Lord Jesus and you'll be saved. Uh, in all of John's uh, writings, we see that he uses believe uh, just 102 times, 102 times. He only mentions repentance 12 times. Eight times uh, repentance is mentioned um, uh, in the uh, book of Revelation. And it's mentioned with regard to the people in the churches who are in sin. So if, if you're an unbeliever and you want to follow Jesus, simply believe that Jesus' death is sufficient to pay for your sin. If you're a believer, if you've made a confession of faith in Jesus and you find yourself in sin, then the word to you is confess. Repent from your sin, confess, that is change your mind about it. Agree with God that your behavior is sinful and confess that to him. And confess, the Greek word is just homo logoian, which means to say together or to say in agreement. So um, just simply believe in him and you'll become uh, saved. And if you're in sin, the word to you is turn from your sin, turn your mind from it, repent, and confess your sin to the Lord. Let me come back to uh, the people in the area. In verses 57 to 60, we come across a man by the name of Joseph of Arimathea. Uh, Joseph um, asks Pilate for Jesus' body. All of the gospel accounts talk about Joseph, include Joseph. Uh, Mark and Luke make it clear that he was a member of the council. By this, I think they mean the Sanhedrin. And Mark says he was looking for the kingdom of God. He was a wealthy man, according to Matthew. And uh, Luke calls him a good and righteous man. Uh, and Mark says that he's a prominent member. He's a, he's a well-known member of the Sanhedrin. And Mark says also that he had to muster up the courage to go get Jesus's body. Because up to this point, according to John's gospel, he had been a secret disciple of Jesus. So he and John says he was helped by Nicodemus, uh, took Jesus's body from the cross. Um, some of the accounts seem to indicate he did it directly. Um, others, perhaps uh, he had uh, servants do that so he would not become ritually defiled for the Passover, uh, which was rapidly coming upon them. But of all the people that were witnessing Jesus' crucifixion, it was only Joseph of Arimathea uh, in Matthew's account that stepped forward and asked for the body and identified himself with Jesus. Brothers and sisters, all of us need to do that at some point in our life. All of us need to identify ourselves with Jesus. Again, if you're watching this and someone's recommended you watch it and you're not a believer, then uh, I urge you uh, to identify yourself with Jesus by putting your faith in him, by confessing that uh, he is your savior, that his death on the cross is sufficient to pay for your sin. And all the riches associated with that instantly become yours as God justifies you, declares you righteous before him. And if you're in, if you're in a believer and you're in sin, I urge you to repent. I'd urge you to confess your sin to God and uh, turn from your sin. Um, so brothers and sisters, um, again, all of us need to make that uh, statement at some point in our lives, uh, that commitment to him or perhaps a recommitment. I urge you to do that today. I urge you to do this uh, even now as I close this out, uh, that as this ends, uh, take a few moments 
uh, confess your sin or confess your need of a Savior and believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. God bless you, brothers and sisters. Thanks so much for watching, and uh, may you continue to grow in God's Word.